We are recording the interview of Charles Slater. This interview is being conducted by Erica Carter from the Wright State University Veterans Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University in the New Media Incubator. It is 3.38 p.m. on September 11, 2018. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Um, let's jump right on in. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born uh, on August 19, 1941 in Baltimore, Maryland. Who were your parents and what were their occupations? My dad was uh, Charles W. Slater also. His middle name was different. Mine's Walter, his was Willard. And my mother was uh, Anna Irene. Uh, he was a uh, conductor on the B&O Railroad. And my mother was a uh, uh, banking clerk of some sort. I don't know exactly what her job was. She worked for a bank in Baltimore. Okay. Uh, do you have any siblings? Yes. I have one brother. He's five years younger. Uh, he served in, in the Navy in the submarine service during the Vietnam conflict. So he, he's also a Vietnam veteran. Oh, that's nice. You have that in common. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was working in a machine shop. I, uh, I started in the machine shop as a helper and had worked my way up uh, to a mechanic and I built uh, food processing machinery. And uh, Uncle Sam came calling and <laughs> I had to give that up for a couple of years. Okay. Which branch of the military did you serve in? I was in the United States Army. Okay. Uh, did you enlist or did you go commission? No, I was one of Johnson's draftees. <laughs> okay. Um, what was basic training like? Basic training, I, I want to point out, I was, I was old for a draftee. I turned uh, uh, 25 years old in my first year in the Army. And uh, uh, it was a shock to me. I, I, I remember I was drafted in Baltimore at Fort Holliburd, Maryland. And from Fort Holliburd, we took a train to Washington, D.C. And uh, from there, we went down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And for a few days, we were in what they call the reception center. That's where all the recruits were coming in to be, uh, uh, you know, given different briefs and so on and so forth. And uh, then we were signed to a company. And I remember getting, jumping off the back of the truck, truck when we got to the company area. There was this drill instructor out there with the Smokey the Bear hat on just bellowing at the top of his voice. And keep in mind, I was almost 25 years old and I was scared. Oh my. <laughs> but uh, we were assigned to a platoon and uh, uh, our platoon sergeant kind of uh, alleviated some of my concerns. He was a great guy. Okay. Do you have any um, other memories, uh, fond memories of basic training? Well, it, you know, this, uh, I, like I said, I was, I was one of President Johnson's draftees. He, he had decided to increase the, the number of troops over there. And basically, uh, we were trained to be killers. And our field instructor, our, the sergeant was in charge of our field uh, instruction. He'd see you walking in the company street and he would holler out, what's the, what's the purpose of hand-to-hand -hand combat? And you say, to kill. You had to scream out to kill at the top of your lungs. And if it wasn't loud enough, he'd ask you again. And basically that's what it was. We were trained and our, our platoon sergeant told, told us, he said, most of you guys are gonna wind up in Vietnam. He said, you might as well accept that now. And he was right. Okay, uh, after you finished basic training, you went on to AIT? Yes, yeah, so I took my advanced training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Didn't have to go too far. And I went to truck driving school which was interesting because I'd only been driving for not even two years, I don't think, because growing up in Baltimore City, I didn't have to drive anywhere. I could take public transportation wherever I wanted to go. So I was, I didn't get my driver's license until I was in 20, in my 20s. And then they put me in truck driving school and that was a whole new experience there, learning to drive a stick shift. And, uh, and I'll say this, that's the one thing that I feel like I, really accomplished or got from the Army experience was, if I can get it started, I can drive it. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
do you do you have a particular favorite vehicle that you enjoy driving or well over there when uh, we were trained on all sort in base in, in advanced training we were trained you know on the jeep on a two and a half ton uh three quarter ton truck but uh we wound up driving uh five ton cargo trucks uh for the year that we were in vietnam okay how did you adapt to military life i i adapted uh, pretty well actually i i like the regimentation you know uh, i like the idea of being able to do things at, at, at given times and 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 uh, in an orderly fashion i guess that's just the way i am i I'm, my my wife used to say i was ocd but <laughs> that's just the way i am okay okay um you finished ait did you go straight to vietnam no from uh, uh fort jackson south carolina we were sent to uh, fort campbell kentucky and that's where they were forming the 592nd transportation company that i was assigned to and uh, uh the first few days I was there, I, I, I lived in, in the barracks, and uh, at the time I was married. I had only been married five months when I got drafted, so uh, my wife came down to live with me, and they allowed me to live off base, so I actually lived in a, in a trailer park for the few months I was there at Fort Campbell. How did your wife feel about you being drafted? Oh, that's a story on to itself. Uh, uh, my, my wife was not happy about me being drafted. And she worked for the Social Security Administration in Baltimore, and she knew the effects of a congressional letter on another federal agency. And she started writing letters to anybody that she could send a letter to. So she, she had no, nothing good to say about my experience in the Army. Thank but. You. Do you have something good to say about it? Well, you know, it's funny. She, like I said, we had only been married five months when I got drafted. She wanted to run away to Canada. But my dad served in World War II. And I just felt an obligation. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Um. So your, your wife comes, and you said you were only there for a few months. Yes, I, we arrived there, I think, in June of uh, 1966. And uh, in September of 66, we departed for uh, San Francisco, California uh, to head to Vietnam. Okay. Did you get to do any sightseeing in California? No. Uh, uh, we, we, we flew from Fort Campbell to uh, San Francisco and got on a ship. And that's how we went to Vietnam, was on, on board the, the William H. Weigel. It was an old World War II ship. Can you and, tell me about that? Well, it was interesting. Uh, uh, we were in the lowest deck in, in, on the ship and they didn't allow us to stay below deck. Every day we had to come topside and, and, and just stay up on, on the deck out in the open air, I guess. And, you know, we would we'd play cards, we'd play chess. Uh, some guys would just lay on the, the hatch covers and, and sunbathe. But uh, I think it took us 21 days to get to Vietnam. Wow. And the thing I remember most about the trip was uh, I, was, I, I had read the books about the Birdman of Alcatraz and all that, but when we left San Francisco, we went past Alcatraz. And... Uh, uh, by that time, I think the place was closed, but I think some Indians had taken over or something and were squatting there. But uh, I took pictures of Alcatraz Island as I went by it, you know. And then, like I said, 21 days at sea. Uh, I think it may have been about day 19, I think we stopped in Okinawa. And they let us go ashore. And uh, being GIs, and cooped up on a ship for 19 days, we found the nearest bar. And uh, having been at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, we went to a, the bar that was called Kentucky. And <laughs> needless to say, you know, we, we consumed a lot of alcoholic beverages and needed help getting back up the gangway to get back on the ship. <laughs> you had enough time to sober up before your arrival. 
Oh yeah, we had two days before we actually actually hit the coast of Vietnam. Okay, so you hit the coast, and then what happened? Well, we uh, uh, there were I can't remember the exact number of companies on the ship, but one of our sister companies we we dropped them off at a location which I don't remember, and then we went into uh, Cameron Bay, and. Uh, you see the World War II movies where you see the guys coming down the sides of the ships on the, on the uh, rope ladders and all that and going into, well, that's what we did. We literally came down the side of the ship with our duffel bags and our weapons and got onto uh, LSTs and they took us ashore. And when we got ashore, there were bases, buses waiting there to take us to our, our camp. And where was your camp? It was there in Cameron Bay. And uh, uh, it was a couple of miles where we landed. Was called South Beach, and from there we went <coughs> just went out towards uh, uh, the uh, South China Sea and to the spot where they designated us to be uh, uh, camped, if you want to call it that, because that's and we uh, when we first got there, all we had was tents, big ten-man squad tents, and uh, it was all sand. And uh, we spent the first few days there getting set up in, 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 in the camp. And then we started uh, actually building our billets that we were going to live in. And, and basically our billets were, were we, we still used the 10-man tent, but what we did was we sunk 55-gallon drums in the ground and filled them with sand, and then we built a flat platform that sat on top of the 55-gallon drums. And then we put a tent on top of that. And that's where we lived for a year. We built sides up on it about halfway, and then we would roll the sides of the tent up to let the air come through and all that kind of stuff. But basically, we lived in a tent on a platform for a year. OK. Um, so you're uh, at your duty station. Um, you've found your way to make, make your uh, place to live. What does an average day look like for you? Well, because we were in the Transportation Corps, uh, we were at a disadvantage when we first got there because we went over on one ship and our equipment went over on another ship. The only thing that we had was our weapons and our duffel bags that had our, our clothing in it. And we were loaned some trucks from another company and our job was to uh, uh, transport cargo from the, the, the uh, dock area to the various depot areas and, and deliver the, the whatever it was. You know, they, they, they sent us everything over there. And then once we got settled in and really got into a routine and we got our own trucks, uh, they assigned us to the ammunition pier. And for the most part, we handled uh, onloading ammunition 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They, they could dock two ammunition ships there at a time, and we worked both sides, and we, we unloaded everything from small arms ammunition to uh, uh, bombs that the Air Force used. And we did that, like I said, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And occasionally we would run convoys to other parts of Vietnam to take supplies into other areas. We were, we were a support team, basically. We were part of the first logistical command there in Vietnam. And we, surprised, we supplied support for the, for the troops as far as uh, equipment and, you know, and, and uh, food. We, we hauled food. Every, anything that could be transported on a truck, we hauled it. Were you ever worried um, transporting goods? Well. Uh, Yes, there were a couple of occasions where we uh, uh, we went into areas that w w where they knew they had no Viet Cong uh, activity or, or North Vietnamese regular activity, and uh, uh, sometimes we had uh, uh, air support. They would have helicopter gunships fly along the route with us, uh, but we always had uh, uh, I mean a uh, uh, machine gun mounted on the jeep that was part of our convoy. So we, we but uh, we never really encountered any problems uh, uh, that really concerned us. One, well, one time we got into an area and uh, we, had, we spent the night because we couldn't get back out because Charlie, as they called the VC, 
had closed off the road. And uh, the next morning, uh, there was a Korean uh, Marine camp there, and they went out and cleared the road, make sure there were no mines and all that kind of stuff, and then we were able to leave. But And then another time, we encountered some uh, sniper fire from, from the hills, but uh, at that time, we had helicopter gunship support, and uh, they discouraged that. <laughs> But in, in the time we were there, I, I never really felt that, that concerned, except, except towards the end when, when I was becoming what they call short time, I only had a few weeks to go. And uh, they sent us on a convoy that took us through an area that we had been gone through for, for months. We had been there any number of times. And, and this particular day, it was interesting, you came down off a mountain and you had to go across this pontoon bridge across this stream and up into the local village. And the good guys were on one side of the road fighting and the bad guys were on the other side of the road. And we had to drive through that to get <laughs> to our destination. That's the only time I really became worried. Did you have ammo on the back of the truck? Yes, we carried, we carried a rifle. Uh, uh, in later years, I think they assigned uh, shotguns to the, to the uh, drivers, but we actually had an M14 rifle and uh, uh, that's the only time I ever really took my rifle from behind my seat and put it next to me so it would be close to me. Okay. Great. What was um, food like? Food? Yeah. Well, anybody that's ever been in the military would say it's terrible. And basically it was. It, it, you know, it, not being able to get fresh stuff uh, you know, gave some limitations, but uh, uh, we had a mess hall. They allowed us to eat breakfast, and when we first got there, they allowed us to come back to the mess hall for lunch. But then uh, we started hanging around too long, and it, and it cut down on our production as far as the tonnage that we were required to haul. You know, and so they said we couldn't come back to the company area for lunch anymore. They gave us sea rations. And, uh, you know, basically that's stuff in a can. And you, you learn little tricks as, as the days go on. And, and some of this stuff, when you open it up, you how in the world can I eat this? Uh, you would see congealed grease on the top of it. And all, but we learned the trick that if you take the main course, it was, it was uh, uh, beef and potatoes or whatever, you put it on the manifold of your truck and drive around for about an hour, and it would heat it up enough that you could open the can and eat your lunch. And uh, of course, the big trade is if you could get a can of sea rations that had fruit cocktail in it. And uh, because fruit cocktail was, was, was a good, good treat. And they always gave you some, some cracker that was like eating cardboard and peanut butter that could pull your dentures out if you wore them. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. How did you keep in touch with uh, your wife and family? Uh, well, the only communication we had was, was through the mail. And uh, I, unfortunately, I wasn't a big, big letter writer. She was a constant red -alight, uh, red letter writer. And, but that, that's how we kept in touch. And occasionally, she, you know, she would send a, what they called a care package. She would have things from home, you know, things we could snack on or something we couldn't get there that we needed. And uh, I've never been a coffee drinker. I, I've always drunk tea, and I drank hot tea. And so I asked her to send me an electric teapot and some tea bags. So every morning, and I wasn't a big breakfast eater, so I wouldn't go to the mess hall to eat. I would have my cup of tea in my tent, and then from there we'd go down to the motor pool and start our day. Okay. Um. Did you make any friends? Oh yeah, the guy. The, you know, it, it. You know, they talk about the band of brothers, and that's what we were. And a lot of the guys that I was stationed with, was, uh, were inducted with me at the same place in Baltimore, so we got to be real good friends. And uh, uh, like I said, they they were like brothers. And uh, when when they had a problem, you had a problem, and and you know they. We gave each other support. That's really nice. 
Um, so you're there for a year. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a bad tour. No, it, it, well, I didn't think it was. You know, some some people might say that you know it was a terrible experience, but I thought I gained a, a lot from the experience and learning how to drive a, a truck, and 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 like I said, I, I I like the regimentation that the army gives you. You know, I I wasn't the best soldier around. I guarantee you that I got in I got into some trouble, but. Uh, <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Well, we had we, we 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 had a fellow in our in our squad that had a big mouth, and sometimes he didn't know when to shut up. And one of the sergeants had come into the the, the the hooch, and started giving us a hard time. And basically, I told him, you know, buzz off. We know what we got to do. Let us alone. Well, you know, I was accused of being insubordinate. Subordinate, so. Uh, they, they, they tried to court martial me, but, uh, but that never happened. But, uh, like I told you earlier, my wife was a letter writer. She wrote to the senators and congressmen. And so in the army, the, your file was called a 201 file. And, uh, my 201 file was getting thicker and thicker <clears throat> because every time, excuse me, that there's a congressional inquiry your company commander has to respond. So my, my 201 file was getting thicker and thicker because she was writing letters to these congressmen and senators because she missed her husband. And uh, I can remember one time I, my company commander called me into the office and when I walked through the door he says, is your wife still writing letters, Chuck? And I said, yes sir, she probably is. And he says, well, What's the problem this time? I said, you know, I, mean, I don't know what, she, what she's complaining about now. But I had to be careful about what I wrote about when I wrote home. Because if she took offense to it and thought something was wrong, she would write a congressman. And the real clincher was she wrote to General Westmoreland. General Westmoreland was the commander of the forces in Vietnam at the time I was there. And that particular day I was out uh, running beach clearance. We were hauling uh, uh, cargo off the beach out to the depot area. And uh, uh, we had a, a sergeant that, that patrolled around to make sure you were doing your job, you know. And, and when you came back from a run, you checked in with him to let him know. And, and when he saw my name, he said, he said, they're looking for you back at the, uh, he says, where have you been? I said, well, I've been, you know, delivering car. He said, well, they want you back at the motor pool. I said, okay, he's going back to the motor pool. So I went back to the motor pool and I walk in there, where have you been? I said, I've been doing my job. Well, they want you up in the company area. So I went up to the company area, I walk into the first sergeant's office and he said, where have you been? I went to the same routine, I'm, I'm calling cargo. Well, General Westmoreland called for you and wanted to talk to you. I said, oh, I was just a surprise, you know. And apparently I had mentioned something in one of my letters and my wife picked up on it and wrote General Westmoreland. Well, by the time they found me and I got back to the company area, uh, General Westmoreland had better things to do than talk to Chuck Slater. So uh, I spoke to one of his aides, I, who I think was a major or something, and <clears throat> we talked and uh, he said, okay, give the phone back to your, your first sergeant. And you know the. Uh, first sergeant is talking to this officer and he said, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. And he hangs up the phone. He said, Slater, whatever you want to do, go do it. I'll call the motor pool and tell them you're out of service. And I think it was at the time my wife had converted to Catholicism. I was baptized and confirmed in, in the uh, uh, Byzantine rite of the Catholic Church, which is a little bit different than the Roman Catholic. But she had converted to Catholicism while I was overseas. And she wanted to take, I needed to take First Holy Communion. And that's what I, I was trying to be able to see a priest to go to confession and take my First Holy Communion. And I told her I hadn't been able to do that. And that's why she wrote General Westmoreland. So they told me to go do what I had to do. And I found Father, whoever he was at the time. And we did, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 25 years old. And 
you know, you, when you go to confession, <clears throat> how do you confess 25 years of your life, you know? <laughs> so he would ask, well, did you do this? I, no. Did you kill anybody? No. And, and, but anyway, I, I wound up having my first Holy Communion in Vietnam. Whoa, that's an experience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See, in the Byzantine church, you're baptized and confirmed at the same time. It's not like in the Roman Catholic church where you go to classes and then you're baptized, you know. In the Byzantine church, it's all done at the same time. At least that's what they told me. And I, I had never understood why, why my mother had me baptized Catholic because from the time I was able to, get, able to go to Sunday school, I went to a Methodist church. So, I don't know. Maybe she wanted you covered all the way around. I guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, let's go back a little bit. You had, when you were about ready to go, you said you were a short timer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you tell me about your leaving Vietnam? Well, uh, by, the, by the time we got sure enough where we were starting, to, to, we, they gave, we had the paperwork we had to take care of. You, any place that that uh, you had equipment from, you had to, like, we had to go to the supply sergeant and get a release from him. We had to turn in our weapon and, and get a release for that. And uh, basically you had to get all these releases uh, so that you could, you could go home. And I had, I had taken the test, I was what they call a specialist four, or spec four, or E4 is what the military ranking was. And I had taken the test to uh, advance to E5, which is a specialist five. And the only difference was my, my symbol was, a, was a, uh, an eagle. And the E5 was the eagle with the umbrella over it. We call it an umbrella, a stripe over top of it. And uh, so I had taken the test. And uh, when the orders came down, I wasn't on the list. So I said something to the first sergeant. He said, well, he said, they're going to be sending more orders down. Uh, maybe maybe you'll uh, get it done. Well, the second batch of orders came down, and I still didn't get my promotion. So I asked again, and he said, uh, uh, well, he said, because you're such a short timer, he said, they're going to hold that slot open, that rank open for somebody that's going to be here. Uh, he said, now, if you want to extend, we'll, let you, we'll make you E5. I said, no thanks, Sarge. I want to go home. <laughs> Did you uh, go home the same way you got there? No, we flew. We flew uh, uh, from uh, Cameron Bay, uh, Vietnam, to uh, I think we stopped in Tokyo on the way. And then we flew into Fort Lewis, Washington. And from Fort Lewis, Washington, I flew back to Baltimore, where, where I was from. OK, so you only had to serve one year and then year. plus training. Um, and then you were completely free of the army? No, I still had time. I still had time. When I got back to the States, I still had enough time to serve that I was stationed at, at Aberdeen Crewing Grounds in Maryland, which was about 50 miles from where I lived. So I was able to drive back and forth every day to uh, uh, Aberdeen. And when I got to Aberdeen, I was still in transportation. My job was to take outpatients from uh, Aberdeen Crewing Grounds, and there was another military installation there uh, close to Aberdeen called Edgewood Arsenal. And I would sometimes occasionally pick up patients there, but I had to take them over to Washington to Army, uh, Army Reed, the, uh, the Army, I can't remember the name of the hospital. It's Walter Reed? Walter Reed, that's it, Walter Reed Army Hospital. And I would wait for my patients to go see their doctors and when they all came back to the parking lot where I was parked, we'd go back, head back to the base in, in, in Aberdeen. And I did that for the last three and a half months that I was in the Army. How was your reception coming home um, by civilians, by your wife, family from Vietnam? Uh, people were funny because at the time, about the time I came home is when all the protests were starting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been called baby killer. And I never fired a shot in Vietnam, but that's, you know, that's, that was their perception. And, and uh, we didn't receive a big parade. Okay, I'm very sorry for that, because what you, you did was, was very honorable, and I appreciate that. Well, people are finally realizing that now. Okay. 
Um, when you got home, you came to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Um, you said we a lot. I'm assuming these are your buddies that you're saying we about. <coughs> it's, it's funny. Uh, two of the guys that I was stationed in Vietnam uh, got assigned to Aberdeen also. And one of the guys was from Baltimore, where I was from. And uh, the, the other fellow w uh, was from Camber uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, so, yeah, well, I, so I had two buddies at Aberdeen. My, the, the fellow from Baltimore, he was assigned to driving a bus, school bus for the Catholic children. The, the Catholic school was off base there at Aberdeen, and his job was to take the children from Aberdeen to the Catholic school every day. And then in the afternoon, he would go and pick them up and bring them back. And uh, my other buddy, he, he did whatever they told him he had to do. <laughs> I don't know. What, I never knew exactly what he was assigned to do, but. I took care of outpatients at Walter Reed, and my buddy took the Catholic kids to school. Okay. And 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 being able to live off base was was a good experience, because uh, I could go home every night and you know be with my wife. And uh, the only time I had a, a, a little scary experience was I had left Aberdeen one morning about <clears throat> about seven o'clock, and it started snowing, and Aberdeen was north of Baltimore. And when I got to the Harvard Tunnel to go under the harbor at, at, uh, in Baltimore to get on uh, the walk, Baltimore Washington Expressway to go to D.C., we had about four inches of snow on the ground. And so I, I got to the hospital. That day I was driving a, a small, about 15 passenger bus. And my people went to see their doctors and they came back to, to the bus and we took off for, for Aberdeen. Well, it was snowing so hard that the snow was piling up on, on the windshield of my bus, and the defroster wasn't working very well. So every once in a while, I would reach up and bang the windshield so the snow would slide off. Well, one of the patients that I was hauling, this gentleman, he would come over, and he'd, every so often he'd bang on the window so I could keep both hands on, <laughs> on the steering wheel. And we finally made it back to Aberdeen about 8 o'clock that night. And by that time, there was probably be 8 to 10 inches of snow on the ground. And when I went in, when I pulled up outside the motor pool office, my bus had died on me. And I walked in the office and I put my paperwork down. And I said, the bus is out in the middle of the street. I said, the battery's dead. I'm going home. And the guy said, oh, your wife called. She said to spend the night here. I said, are you kidding? I said, I just drove from D.C. all the way back here. I, I can sure as hell get back to Baltimore. And I left and I got home probably about two hours later. But I went home that night. And that was the only bad experience I had that whole time that I was going back and forth to Walter Reed Army Hospital. It was, was that snowstorm. I'm sorry to hear that that, um, that, that was your bad time. Um, how did you readjust to civilian life after you got out? Well, I, I, I went back to my old job working in a machine shop. They, you know, they gave me my job back, and, and I went to work. And uh, I started looking for someplace else to work because uh, uh, the company I worked for didn't, have, didn't pay that well, and they had no benefits at all. I didn't have health insurance. I had to have my own health insurance. And so I started looking for... for uh, someplace else to work. Well, my wife's father had worked for an old company, and I saw an advertisement in the newspaper for a job at a, another old company. And uh, I thought, well, I'll go down there and apply for a job. I forgot what the job was. I think it was what they called a chemical plant operator at the time. But uh, my wife, her dad having worked for another oil company, she called a friend of hers that had, had uh, worked with her dad for years. Her, that's something else I forgot to tell you. Her dad had passed away while I was in Vietnam. And this was another reason why she wasn't happy about the Army. They came to me and said that the Red Cross was going to send me home because my father-in-law was terminally ill. And I had to turn in all of my equipment before I left and they were going to send me home. Well, at the last minute, they said, you can't go home because it's not a blood relative. So they 
postponed the funeral thinking I was coming home and then got the word that I wasn't coming home. And, uh, but anyway, that, I, I kind of backtracked there. But uh, uh, so I, the people at the oil company knew who I was because they had come to our wedding. And, and uh, uh, by this time, her feelings for the military were, were, were you couldn't put it in words. But uh, she called a friend of hers that worked with her dad and told him that I was looking for a job. And uh, uh, the boss there called me and said, you know, we, we've got a, a clerk retiring. And he said, would you be interested in the job? And I said, uh, yeah. And so I went down, I talked to him, and, and, and uh, he asked me, he said, can you type? And I said, yes, sir, like this. He said, can you run a 10 key? I said, yes, sir, like this. He said, when can you start? And uh, that was City Service Oil Company. And I worked for them for 31 years. <laughs> That's so I went from being a mechanic to being a clerk. And when I finally retired from the oil company, I was the manager of a, of a fuel storage facility uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we put about 15 million gallons of product through that terminal every day. Wow. And, uh, and I, I just got in, I, you know, I got into a routine. I did my job. Uh, uh, my wife had our two children. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I never looked back on my time in the military as a bad experience. I, I, uh, I thought of it as, as a learning experience because it was entirely new to me. I mean, I was, you know. And, and, and I think what helped me was a lot of the guys I served with were kids, 18, 19 years old. And here I was, I turned uh, uh, 26 in Vietnam. So I was an old man. I mean, we had hooch girls that used to clean our hooches and do our laundry and stuff for us, the Vietnamese girls. And they called me Papa Son because I was an older man. And uh, a lot of the guys now at our, at our reunion that we're at this week, or, or, you know, five and six years younger than me. So, you know, when I got out, uh, got a decent job, I was readily settled down. I, matter of fact, I bought my first house while I was on leave from the military after getting back from Vietnam. My wife and I had been living in, a, uh, my wife and I had been living in an apartment uh, in, a, in a big old house. We had the first floor of the house. And uh, my mother-in-law was selling a, another house that she she and her husband owned. When she when he passed away, she was getting rid of these things, and she wanted to give it to my wife and I. And my wife and I, I grew up in Baltimore City in a row house, and she lived in the house. My wife grew up in the house that they were selling, and she didn't want to live in that house. And so uh, my mother-in-law said, "Well, I'll sell the house, and and you can use the money towards a house you want." Well, the realtor that was handling the sale of her house said there's a house for sale right down the street from where we were living. Two blocks down, it was the last street off the, high, off the main drag, it was, a, a, it was a four bedroom Cape Cod. And <clears throat> this is going to tell you how old I am. At the time, they were asking $18,000 for it. And I, I told the real estate lady, I said, I'm, I'm, lady, I'm still, I'm still in the military. I said, I still got, you know, a few months to go before I get out. So my pay is not that good. She said, well, how much earnest money can you give me? And I said, well, I'll give you $75. That's, that's all I can give you. And she did. I bought my first house with $75 earnest money. <coughs> Excuse me. That's something. Are you a member of any veterans organizations? I'm a member of the American Legion, but it, uh, uh, and I'm a life member of the VFW, Veterans of Hard War. Okay. Do they do anything special or fun? Well, when I when I first got back to the state, I, I got into the VFW when I was in Vietnam. Actually, my wife's uncle was active in a local VFW post there in Baltimore, and. Uh, they were signing up guys that were stationed in Vietnam. They're, they were paying their membership for them. And then when we got back, I joined, you know, I went to the post meetings and all that. And at one point I was, well, I started out as a chaplain, which I'll never 
understand why they made me chaplain, but anyway. But then I was, I was post commander for a year. And uh, we didn't have a post home. We, we met at the Knights of Columbus Hall. And, uh, you know, we celebrated the, the various holidays that, that the veterans celebrate. Okay. okay. Um, is there anything you feel we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? Well, not that I know of. I, you know, I, you know, the, you hear so many different tales about the war in Vietnam. Like you, you had the protesters protesting the war, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't know what to expect when I got there. But you had a job to do and you did it. And uh, as far as, you know, calling guys that served over their baby killers or whatever, you know, they didn't know what was going on over there. And, and I think that's what scared them more than anything, that they didn't know. And so, you know, they were protesting the war. And now that I think back on it, did, did, I, did, I, did, it, did it, my service do any good? I like to think it did because I was in an outfit that was supporting the troops that were actually doing the fighting, you know. So, uh, you, I don't think you can ever say that the war is just, but there was a cause they thought they had, and you know, it, was, it took a few years to realize that, hey, maybe we're in it for the wrong ideas, you know. And I mean, the French were there for so many years, they lost. We went in there for so many years and we lost. But now we have an excellent relationship with Vietnam. One of the shirts I brought with me on this trip today or this week was made in Vietnam. So, you know, I, I, after it's all said and done, you know, the, the, the countries have come together. We've recognized their, their right to be what they are. And uh, they've forgiven us for what we did. Okay. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will, who will hear this interview? Uh, it's hard to say. I, uh, everybody will have a different story, but uh, it's, it's an experience I wouldn't want to go through again, but I, I think it was a learning experience. And as far as the war, uh, take it from somebody like me, uh, it was necessary to a certain degree, and we did what we had to do until it was time to get out. And, you know, whatever you think of war or, or, or your friends think of war, you know, war doesn't solve any problems. It just creates casualties. Okay. This concludes the interview with Charles Slater. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Glad to do it.